Chapter 5. Calamity. Friendship. Friendship never changes. Alive! I was alive! As consciousness came back to me, I found myself lying on a mattress, with blankets tucked around me. Feeling warm, and rested, and more comfortable than I had been since I left Stable 2 three days ago. At least, I thought it was three days. I had no idea how long I had been unconscious. By habit, I lifted up my forehoof to check my date and time on my pit buck. In doing so, unsettled the blanket, which proceeded to slide to the floor. Oh, look who's awake! The pretty voice of a mare, awfully close to me, shook me into full alertness. Looking up and about, I surrounded myself. I saw myself surrounded by several ponies, only one of which I recognized. And that was the Pegasus who shot me up in the first place. I wondered if I was his prisoner. The voice had come from an equally pretty, white-coated earth pony, whose cotton candy pink mane matched the pink and yellow striped nurse's dress she was wearing. Scanning what I could see of the walls through the small crowd of ponies, I saw a line of three medical boxes, all the little pink butterflies perfectly in a row, and a faded pre-war poster apparently advertising jobs in healthcare services. You don't need to be a steel ranger to be a hero. Join the Ministry of Peace today, announced the mayor on the poster, barely more than a filly, who wore exactly the same dress that I saw brought to life before me. Between the decor and the lack of ropes and chains, I concluded I was in a clinic, and I was not a captive. Besides, I was actually feeling quite good. I'm tired, almost like I needed a good nap, except I wasn't sleepy, just tired and kind of warm. I sat up, and the room spun. Take it easy there, partner, the Pegasus, whose name I recalled was Calamity, although I was a bit fuzzy on how I learned it, said, and stepped towards me. I scooted back on the mattress. Oh, sure. He looked polite and gentle now, with all these ponies around, but I'd seen him when he was all murder from above, guns blazing, death pegasus. Candy, one of the other ponies, a gray-coated earth pony with a black mane and tail, asked as he looked at my nurse. Although to me, it sounded like he was calling her Candy, and I felt an oddly cheerful urge to agree. Oh, she'll be perfectly fine. A mix-up with the last healing potion she needed and gave it to her less than an hour ago. Mixed? The Earth Pony raised an eyebrow doubtfully. Candy smiled. Why, with apple schnapps, of course. I mixed the medicine to get... Mixed the medicine always goes down better that way. I couldn't understand why the Great Pony facelift. I felt perfectly fine now. Better than fine. Perfectly warm. The Grey Stallion started shooing all my guests away. That made me feel slightly sad, although I didn't really know any of them. I had felt so lonely the past, past few days, so eager to find a civilization, and here it was, but he wasn't letting me keep it. A thought which I realized didn't quite make sense though, although I wasn't sure why. Come on, out you go, I and mean, come on out when you're feeling better. I know there's some ponies who'd like to see you, the gray stallion smiled at me, then looked at the rust-colored straggler. You too, Calamity. How'd you go? Calamity took one look back at me before scooting out. Candy pranced up to me and whispered dreamily, Such a handsome stallion, isn't he? Who? Why, Calamity, of course, she giggled. I was at a loss for words. No. No, I wasn't. He shot me. She waved that off with a hoof wiggle. I'm sure that was just a misunderstanding. It was, I recalled. But why was I having this conversation? If anything, I wanted to talk about how pretty Candy was. Candy. Candy! 
not talk about calamity. At least, least of all, whether or not he was handsome. None of which seemed to find a suitable way to be spoken about aloud. Sulkingly, I fell back on reiterating. He shot me, then added, a lot. More rested, and with much clearer head, I was eager to meet the ponies of New Appaloosa. But my pit buck, by my pit buck, it had been out of it for nearly two days. I gazed over the railing at the walled village. Multiple lines of what I had realized were railroad tracks converged into a town made up of largely a dozen upon dozens of virtually identical homes built from passenger cars. Many of them stacked two or three high, and most still had their wheels. Heavy metal boxcars formed a ring around the town, with a massive gate on either side. Armored pony guards walked around the tops of the boxcars, keeping their eyes on the wastes outside. Inside, scores of earth and unicorn ponies trotted about their daily lives. This place was dirty, rusty, and altogether wonderful. How did you get them stacked like that? I asked, looking up at the stacked train cars, the tallest being four high. Railings and catwalks spanned out from it, connecting to the other towers. On the highest roof, brilliant glowing letters announced Turnpike Tavern. Rail lighting, the gray black stallion, who turned out to be the sheriff, mayor, general, hold together the town, deadpan. Had one of the unicorn ponies do it. I turned with a gasp, staring at him. I'd never heard of a pony levitating anything that big or heavy before. Railright held that serious expression for a moment longer, before shorting. I'm just playing with you. My astonishment faded to see a sheepish grin as he smiled and pointed towards the sky above us. That's what the crane's for. Looking up and back, I could see a huge orange tower of metal jutting out of the town. A massive hook dangling from its long arm. Although, he continued, if you're looking for a heavy lifter, you can't do better than Crane. I think you should talk to him. Talk to Crane? I said slowly, trying to gauge if this was another joke. But it wasn't. Crane told me was the name of a unicorn pony who worked in the train yard. Won't find a stronger telekinetic this side of the Canterlot ruins. And with that, Railwright offered me the Grand Tour. New Appaloosa's general supply store was called Absolutely Everything. It was the fourth stop on the tour. Railwright smiled knowingly as he coaxed me towards the odd-looking building. Three chain cars, each a different type, had been fused together to create a store, and one of them was a barrel-shaped car of black metal dominated by a smokestack. This was one of the sources of smoke I had seen in the distance. Pausing at the front of the door, I read the signs beneath the playful block letters of the store name. Yes, we do deliveries. No hooves, nasty stingers, no service. Ask me about special orders. I won't answer, but I'll get right on it. Wasteland Survival Guide, available now. First copy for every family is free. I pushed the door open and stepped inside, and stopped with a gasp as I saw the zombie pony from the raider library. I could tell she was the same one by the way her eyes rolled up, and the fact that she recognized me with an immediate bright smile and dashed over to me, it un to give me an uncomfortably squishy hug, were admittedly also clues. She backtrotted and waved a forepaw about it what was in a surprised 
effective combination of welcome and showing off of the store. Something I hated to admit, I was thankful for, as a stench of her as she hugged me forced me to hold my breath. I had been sure gagging would have been impolite. Uh, hello again, I said, feeling a little awkward. Last time this Pegasus zombie pony saw me, I was trotting off to put a bullet in a raider pony's brain. Howdy, said a familiar voice off to my left. I had been so focused on the zombie pony that I had totally missed that there were other people in the store. Turning, I found Calamity, looking back at me with a bashful smile. Look before you scamper. I just want to say how sorry I am. I didn't scamper, although I did take a cautious step back. I've been getting the store from Ditsy Doo here, see? Ditsy Doo? I turned to the Pegasus zombie. You wrote this arrival, guide? But Ditsy Doo's eyes managed to focus on me, and she absolutely beamed with joy, nodding feverishly. Yes, I do deliveries. Suddenly, I had a very good idea of how that book ended up in the Ponyville Library, which in turn fortified my suspicions about Watcher. While I was thinking, Ditsy Doo had rushed up with another copy of the book in her mouth and was stuffing it into my saddlebags. The zombie pony was amazingly kind and generous, and had a severe problem with personal space. I opened my mouth to say something. Maybe that I already had a copy, although considering there were several pages torn out from the copy of the Raiders table, having another could still be quite helpful. However, whatever I was about to say got derailed by a strange realization. You don't talk much. Do you? Could zombie ponies talk? Ditsy Doo stepped back and opened her muzzle wide, giving me a look at the inside of her mouth that I ever wanted. Calamity focused my attention. Ditsy Doo's tongue was cut out by slavers a few decades ago. She gets by without it real well, though. So then, Monetary Jack's warning had been cringingly accurate. Ditsy Doo trotted to the sales counter, where she picked up a pencil in her teeth and scribbled something on the first sheet of a large pad of notepaper. She dropped the pencil and held up the notepad, her eyes going weird again. Looking strictly at the paper, so my gaze didn't rudely follow her eye, I read aloud. Because I couldn't talk, I took up writing, and if it hadn't been for that, I would have never gotten so good at it. I looked up at her and blinked. Ditsy Doo put down the pad, picking up the pencil again and adding a line before lifting it up for me to read again. Now, how about we get you some better armor? Bottle caps? That's what ponies used for money out here? As absurd as it was, and it was ludicrous, I should have seen that coming. No wonder raiders were hoarding the things. No wonder there were empty bottles littered everywhere, and not a bottle cap to be found. Except, of course, for the one I tossed casually away, somewhere inside Ironshot Firearms. My stable utility barding was back at absolutely everything. Ditsy Doo didn't have any armor in my size, but swore she could modify my barding so that it was better than the best armor any raider could scavenge together. She offered to do it for free, but I insisted on paying her for her work. And that's when I discovered the absolutely cockeyed, no offense to Dissy, bartering system used throughout the equestrian race wasteland. Bottle caps. Seriously. Fortunately, pre-war money was still worth something, if only in bulk. And if for no other reason than they could get sodas out of the machine that hadn't simply been pried open and raided already. Ditsy Doo took all but a few of my coins, and I had no idea if what I was giving her was a fair price. But I suspected I was getting a generous discount. She also insisted on giving me a sheet of paper detailing an entirely different use for bottle caps, a way to turn them into homemade mines. Apparently, it was going to 
be an insert for the Wasteland Survival Guide's chapter on mines that some pony discouraged her, probably wise, from including. When I had left absolutely everything, Railwright commented, Ditsy Doo's our resident Pegasus, as well as our resident Ghoul. Right, because Ghoul Pony sounds so much better than Zombie Pony. Although, he had continued, poking a hoof towards Calamity, I keep telling this one that he's always welcome to settle down here in my town. He's always keeping the caravan safe for going on two, four years now. Now, as I was on my way to meet Crane, with Calamity trotting beside me, I finally ventured conversation with the rush-colored stallion. So, you don't live here? Nope. Got my own place about half an hour's flight distance. I thought over what I knew of the Pegasus ponies. A place up in the clouds? I could swear Calamity's eyes widened just a bit. Oh no. Just a shack. Some pony threw together a few generations ago. Only, they get eaten by the wild animals in these parts. I'd already encountered some of the wild animals in these parts. As we walked down the catwalk, my gaze fell onto a strange weapon that Calamity wore. My eyes following the gun barrels to the odd metal protrusions that stuck out in front of him. A control mechanism, I suspected. I opened my mouth to ask him about it but only to find myself looking at air. I stopped and looked back. He had halted abruptly to let by a mare in a straw sun hat and her colt. The mare was apparently having trouble keeping the colt from dashing off at top speed, and she looked like she wanted a leash. But Ma, I want to go see Derpy! Clementy leaned close and whispered, That's what some folks call Ditsy Doo, because of the eye. Yeah, because that's what they'd focus on. The bullies back in Stable 2 would have totally ignored the whole putrefying flesh thing for that. She doesn't seem to mind. I actually think she finds it endearing. I did not point out that Ditsy Doo didn't seem to have a mind. Didn't seem to have a... Didn't seem to mind having your tongue cut out either. Didn't make it right. Trolley! You get back here, the mother called out as the colt started to trot a little too fast. And you stay away from that store. I don't want you bothering that thing. Thing? Okay, I'll admit I thought of her as an it a few times, but that was back when I thought she was dead. I stopped. Excuse me, miss. I'm new here. Is there something wrong with Zom uh, ghoul ponies? The mare looked abashed, staring more at Clamity than me. I didn't need to look. I could feel his scowl. Well, nothing against good old Derpy. I mean, Miss Ditsy Doo. But, well, you know. Know what? I persisted, trying not to hint at the shame I was feeling for having balked at her small, at her smell or the grossly squishy way her hug felt. Well, the murder looked about furtuitively and then lowered her head, whispering, you know they're all like ticking time bombs, right? I mean, you can see what being a ghoul is doing for their outsides. Imagine what it's doing to their brains. They all go mad sooner or later. Dear Ditsy, she's lasted a good long time, and she's only a little crazy for it. But someday, I just don't want my boy to hurry to that thing alone. Or be there when she finally turns on us all. With that, the mare drew herself up and pulled Trolley close and hurried off. Anyway, notably to absolutely everything. I stood there for a long time, stunned. And finally, I asked Calamity, Is that true? Calamity sighed deeply, which was not a good sign. A yep. For most of them, anyways. You get into the wrong places and you'll find yourself hunted by a whole pack of cannibal ghoul ponies gone zombie. But I mean, this is only most of them. And even they're good pony folk. If a little smelly, strange looking. Until that day. 
Some, like good to do, break the odds and never lose their noodle. I understood the spirit of his words, but the news didn't make me scared of the hairless Pegasus rider. It made me ache for her. Crane was a yellow unicorn pony, with an orange and beige striped mane and tail. He wore a bright orange construction hat, with a hole in it for his horn. When we found him, he was unloading barrels into the flatbed of a train car. This one actually still on the tracks that ran through town, and connected to several others. Howdy! Pleased to meet you there, little mare, with the pip buck who saved Sweet Apple and did to do. Not to mention Desert Rose, Barrel Cactus, and Turquoise. He stopped to shake my hoof vigorously. Pleased to meet you, too, I said, feeling a touch wobbly after the hoof shake. Rare Rat told me you'd have only to talk to if I wanted to get some heavy lifting. Crane smiled, then casually lifted three barrels at once, putting them in their place on the flatbed. Reckon I am. Then to my shock, he asked, What kind of spells you got? Spells? I replied hesitantly. You know, he continued talking, while three barrels levitated by, glowing with the same light that shone around his horn. Unicorn pornies generally have a small collection of magic spells, usually related to what he or she is destined to be good at. Except for the ones who aren't destined to be good at spells, of course, because then they just get a whole heap of them. Me, for instance, I can make all manner of pairs on the rails and trains just by focusing at them. Crap. Kicking a hoof at the ground, I sighed deeply. Nope, just telekinesis, no spells. I knew I was pathetic. Levitation was basically Philly stuff. By the time I got my cutie mark, every other unicorn in Stable 2 had a nice collection of spells. Thank you, Crane, for reminding me of that and that I was probably the most unmagical unicorn ever. Crane's eyes widened in surprise, and he quickly changed the subject. Now, I've got lots of work to do, but I can tell you what. If you would do me a small favor, I'll return it by teaching you everything I know about heavy lifting. It sounded great to me. What's the favor? Fetch him a soda? Maybe some lunch? Help tie down the barrels on the flatbed. We've been having a bit of trouble with the things that have been crawling out of the stable was to hear. And from what I hear, the almighty brave ain't no slouch and sling a firearm. Just get down there in the stable and close the door. I reckon we can clear out the varmints up here if some pony locks the breeding grounds. Okay, not a soda run. So, why are you with me again? The sky had darkened prematurely, and it soon would turn. I had to turn on my lamp spell on my pit buck. I figured I owe you one, Calamity said in earnest, as he followed beside me. Maybe a whole mess of ones, considering all you did for the good ponies in New Appalosa. With a sigh, I tried to console him. You couldn't have known. I was wearing blood caked raider armor, and carrying an arsenal that would make an average raider radioactive in envy. Caked in raider blood, armor you only had because you needed protection while saving the lives of five good towns ponies. Only four, really. Ditsy Doo saved Sweet Apple. And you saved Ditsy Doo so she could save Sweet Apple. In my book, that makes five. He took a deep breath. Besides, I can't consent you for going down there alone. I've heard dark stories about these stables. Bad things happen down in too many of them. I came from a stable. Hell, every pony came from some pony who came from a stable, right? I can see why an empty one would be an inviting nesting ground, but it's not like the stables are cursed or sinister. Clemity mulled that over. I suppose you're right about that. All except the few like did to do who somehow survived the apocalypse on the surface or are descended from folk who did. I halted my trot, so abruptly that it nearly fell over. My surviving canteen, refilled, swung out and back, smacking me in the chest. Did Sidhu survive the war? 
She's that old? Uh, yep. Ghoul ponies don't age like normal pony folk do. The idea of a pony who'd actually been around way back then, who knew what actually happened, blew my mind away. What's her story? Clemity snorted a laugh. So long, I could ask most of it. I do know she was flying outside Cloudsdale when that first mega spell hit. She was caught at the very edge of the mega of the magical energies that wiped the entire city out of existence. It's been a ghoul ever since. I nodded, continuing in a solemn silence. The image of an entire city in the clouds, filled with Pegasus ponies, played out in my head. There one minute, and then just nothing. The clouds above started to leak. It was like being in a shower back in Stable 2. Only, the shower was everywhere. And it didn't stop. But I hadn't been cleaned by... If I hadn't been cleaned by Candy the day before, I would have welcomed it despite the cold of the water. Now, soaked to the bone, I still found it miserable. The sky had turned so dark that I had to turn on my pit buck lamp to see ahead of me. In theory, it was still daylight, but that was hard to believe. A ferocious wind had picked up out of nowhere and was whipping the rain at us like a weapon. What's going on? I cried out to Calamity above the thunderstorm. It's a thunderstorm, an almighty one. We best be finding some shelter, because it's just getting started. Thunder? I hollered back as a patch of clouds lit up, and briefly, but brilliantly. That's thunder? Kaboom! The sky exploded. It was like the sound of a gunshot, if the gun was wielded by Celestia herself. It was made out of pure awesome. I actually tried hiding under Calamity. Get a hold of yourself there. Timidly, and a little bashfully, I backed up and got to my hooves. Another flash illuminated the whole countryside in stark white and shadows. Bef gone before I realized it had happened. Yet another mighty boom tore through the sky, followed close behind by another flash. Clemity also put his forehooves on me to stop me from trying again. If y'all that scared of thunder, wait till you actually see the lightning, he chuckled. Now, let's get moving so we can find some shelter. Each flash of light in the clouds was followed by a terrifying crack or a mighty boom. A little later, I did indeed see the lightning. I'd been envisioning lightning bolts, like those blasts of electricity, and the brain bots had been shooting at me. This was nothing like that. This was a white tear through the sky like the universe itself had been slashed open. It lasted an eye blink, but it still saw its afterimage floating in front of my face for several minutes later. I saw some pony, or I thought I did, in the far distance on a hilltop, briefly illuminated by the lightning. I couldn't tell if it was a unicorn or a pegasus at first. I thought it was both. But the vision was gone before I could be sure I had seen anything at all. We galloped, and the ground beneath us was increasingly muddy and treacherous, until we were forced to stop by a raging, frothy river. The muddy, rushing water was tearing away at the banks on each side, and I could see the black shapes of uprooted trees as they were carried away. Just beyond the other side of the cliff face, water was pouring down the cracks of the cliff in a hundred rivulets, each feeding into the river at the bottom. Across from us, just a ways up the cliff, was the dark mouth of a cave, and the path up to it was already washed away. I stood there, staring helplessly, trying to figure out how we were going to get across. Then I felt myself being lifted in the air as Calamity flew us over the river and set me down in the mouth of the cave, feeling stupid. I stepped further in, shining the lamp of my pit buck in the cave. The path continued up for about a yard, then took a steep decline with frightfully old metal stairs, rusted nearly black, leading to a concrete landing. Once on the landing, the rough walls were replaced by stonework, and at the end, a very familiar-looking steel door hung 
in its hinge arm. The number 24 was emblazoned upon the center of the door. Beyond lay a rusted, ruined doppelganger of the place I had once believed would be my home forever. A calamity rushed past me. Don't just stand there gawking. Help me get this door shut before the darn river spills over its banks and completely floods this hole. He was trying to push the door physically. I looked down, noticing for the first time that the floor of the cave was already a puddle, two inches deep and growing. Move to action. I rushed the controls. I paused long enough to check the bolting mechanism, which was actually entirely missing, and made sure I'd be able to open it again. Satisfied I could, I tried to push up the lever, but it didn't go. Focusing my horn glowing brightly, I added my telekinetic strength to that of my hooves. And with a loud grinding sound, the lever moved, with a wheeze, and the lever arm moved, and the door to stable 24 slammed shut, groaning in protest. You realize we just shut ourselves into the evil, scary stable of spookiness, right? I teased my self-invited companion as he stared out about the place in wonder. Ah, I'm trusting you're right about what you said earlier. I reckon if any pony knows better, it would be you. He shot me a nervous smile. Besides, he added, flapping his wings, not like these are going to do me any good down here, one way or the other. My eyes caught the harness Calamity wore. The Pegasus had two long-range rifles, one strapped on each side of his body, right under his wing, built into the saddle mechanism. Thin metal reins reached out in front of him, ending in a bit of bit that hovered just a few inches below his mouth. By biting onto it, the sibling barrels could fire at once. The saddle was designed to reload on command, possibly be triggered by pulling on the bit, or biting differently. I couldn't tell. Hey Calamity, I've been meaning to ask you, what is that? I pointed a hoof at the contraption. What? He turned, looking around, spinning in place. I couldn't suppress a laugh, and he stopped, looking at me, then back behind him, again, once more. What? You mean my battle saddle? I nodded. Fine piece of work, ain't it? I designed it myself. He reared up, showing it off proudly, and then, at my expression, asked, You mean to tell me you ain't never seen the battle hardest before? I shook my head. Well, ain't that a thing? He strutted about. There's basically two types of firearms, loosely speaking. There are small ones, that any pony can stick in mouth or levitate, if they're a unicorn. And then there's battle saddles, for all the firearms that are just too big and heavy, and have too much kick to be wielded without support. I've seen all kinds of weapons built into battle saddles. Machine guns, rockets... Rocket launchers? My tail drooped, and ears fell back at the thought. Yep. Even magical energy weapons, he paused. The those are damn scarce, and you're likely not to see one of them yourself. I filed that away for future reference, and after checking my pit buck for radiation or similar dangers, my EFS for any glows of hostility, I took a long gulp from our canteen and began plotting our course. I was confident from my lifetime in the saddle, stable, that I could navigate this one with no problems, if the layout was the same, and the door was right next to the room that should lead the stairs downward. That would be the cafeteria, living quarters, school, and clinic. To the left, a corridor leading deeper into maintenance, including the ever-familiar Pipbuck Technician maintenance shaft. Without a second thought, I decided we would go right first. Calamity, meanwhile, had scouted all the immediate adjacent rooms, and he came back with a mild surprised look. They got a box of dynamite in that storage room over yonder. Okay, that was a bit surprising. My ears stuck up. You weren't going to find that in Stable 2. What was in it? 
Dynamite, I reckon, Calamity said, mock scholarly. In truth, I don't know for sure. It was locked. But I was about to go shaking it like a birthday present, trying to figure out what it was, on the chance that, you know, it might be full of, well, you know, dynamite. I followed the rust-colored Pegasus back to the storage room to check it out. But after three tries, and the loss of two more bobby pins, which I was beginning to run out of, I had to admit that the lock was even better than my self-proclaimed expertise. Instead, I suggested we move along the path I originally planned. The door to the living quarters slid open, and we... with a reassuring hiss. The lights gave off a familiar whine, though they still worked. Already, Stable 24 was making me horribly homesick. Worse, the dull ache in my heart mixed with the disconcerting sense of wrongness seeing this place in rust and ruins was unpleasant in a way that I could not describe. It was like walking through my own personalized vision of the post-apocalypse. I was finding doors that couldn't open. The floor was strewn with tin cans and litter, for generations uncared for, and were making odd, rhythmic churning. And from deeper within came chugging, banging, and hissing sounds that had no place in a stable at all. This was a demoralizing, eerie, spook house version of Stable 2. I turned to look back at Calamity, and caught him picking up bottle caps off the floor. I bit my lip, bracing against a wall, a wave of emotion, that shrieked that he was desecrating this place. Looting and scavenging was survival out the Inquestria wastelands. And logically, that applied to in here too. But even more than stripped of goods off fresh corpses, this felt like grave robbing. Unholy. My feelings scattered out as overhead a burst of thunder hit so close to the cave that we could hear it inside the stable. My heart thumped in my chest. What the hell? I stammered, waving my forehoofs to indicate the sky outside. I told you, thunderstorm. That ain't like a storm I've read about in my textbooks, I cantered. Clemmy looked at me with a soft, mocking expression. Weather ain't like it used to be. The sun and moon ain't guided by the ponies anymore. We Pegasus. The goddess Celestia and Luna moved the sun and moon through the sky each day and every night. I shot back, scandalized. How could he even say that? That was like... Blasphemy! Oh yeah. He rolled his eyes at me. Rolled his eyes! From their place in Pony Heaven. Right. I bristled. And he stared quietly, until I gave in, motioning for him to continue. As I was saying, we Pegasus ain't around scheduling the weather either. Equestria's weather has gotten wild. I felt a chill down my mane, though the metal walls and mountain, we still felt the percussion of the storm. <clears throat> I had begun to wonder how over-engineered Stable 2 must have been for me to never have heard storms like these. Obviously, it was designed to stay closed longer, which I figured probably accounted for the other architectural differences that I had started to notice. Huh? I thought aloud. There was only one section of bathrooms. At least, only one for in the living quarter of the stable. Back in Stable 2, there were two, one for mares, one for stallions. The floor outside was wet, and I could hear a roar gurgling, a splashing sound from behind the bathroom door. Also, unlike Stable 2, Stable 24 was connected to the aquifer. Its water supplies merely purified with antitoxin and anti-radiation spells. With a downpour outside, every sink and toilet was backed up. The same went for the water fountains. 
the one between the school and the living quarter, was spraying brown water. The horrible noises would come from the pipes and plumbing rather than unnatural monsters. I stopped dead as the red spot flashed upon my compass of my EFS. Somewhere just ahead of us was surely one of the creatures Crane had talked about. Not, I realized, that either of us were bothered to hear the description. So, any idea exactly what sort of varmints we're supposed to be looking for down here? I whispered as we both crouched down, moving as stealthily as possible. While bathrooms weren't segregated, sleeping areas were. The main floor was for stallions, and the lower one for mares. And that too was different for stable too. Where the quarters were geared towards families. My EFS felt annoyingly limited. Unable to tell me which level the creature was on. And that was almost a dead end right now. I levitated out little Macintosh. Ready as I could be. Actually, no. Calamity whispered back. And as I recall, we ain't supposed to be looking for him. We're supposed to just close the door. As I recall, I retorted, maybe a slight less bit quietly than I should have, I'm supposed to be closing the door. You weren't supposed to be doing anything. I couldn't deny that he had a point. In fact, if trapped inside this creature's lair, Poking around was probably the dumbest thing a pony could do. On the other hoof, this was another stable. My curiosity and sense of connection wouldn't allow me to leave it unexplored. And if I was trapped in here for a few hours, well, no time like the present. Clemity shook his head, but followed me all the same. We moved us a few steps closer, and the red spot winked out. I turned quickly trying to see if it had somehow gotten behind us, but there was nothing. Either the creature had evaporated, or we were right on top of it. One floor up. We crouched there, standing still and quiet. After a moment, the red spot appeared again, once more right in front of us. And a few seconds later, it vanished once more. This time, apparently for good. Aside from the age and deterioration, the school of Stable 24 looked exactly like the one back home. The students' tables, all in nice little rows, a sharing area with toys, a teacher's desk with a terminal, pencils, and even a long, rotted apple. The only real difference was the large glass tank, which would have once been an aquarium. Even with rusted walls, this felt... This felt like home. It should have been comforting. Instead, it was unpleasantly weird. And it was pulling me on edge. The constant banging and screaming of the pipes was added to my discomfort and giving me a mild headache for good measure. Worst of all, we had encountered three more ghosts. Hostile entities that appeared on my eyes forward sparkle but nowhere else. A matter not at all helped with the fact Calamity had no pipic of his own, and he couldn't tell what I was reacting to. I was beginning to worry that my eyes forward sparkle, or even my pipic itself, had been damaged or warped by exposure to the equestrian wasteland. Unlikely, I reassured myself, remembering that they were made to withstand worse than this. What was more likely, and less comforting, was that the creatures down here had magic of their own. Have you ever heard of any pony named Princess Celeste? What? I trotted over. Brow furrowing. Let me see that. I said, snatching up the book from the desk in front of me with a glowing telekinesis. I read a few sentences and slammed the book shut to look over the cover. It was a children's storybook. The Stallion in the Moon? Calamity chuckled. You know, I think I remember Ma reading me a story like that. Only, it was the Mare in the Moon. If I recollect. That's because it was supposed to be the Mare in the Moon. Quickly, I began looking through the books 
from the desks and shelves. Once I was done, I reached an important feeling observation. 1. Every significant pony in the book had been changed into a stallion. Well, I suppose most of them were stallions to begin with. 2. I continued undaunted, even though my voice sounded strained enough to my own ears. Not one story or textbook has anything but the vaguest references to the history or governance of Equestria. Not that Stable 2's library was stellar in that regard, but most recent history in any of our textbooks was over a generation old. But this here wasn't a lack of material. This was a deliberate alteration of facts and context in, in the proportion of the stable dedicated to education. This was... This was... You know, you're going to burst about something if you don't calm down. A touch. I tossed the book I was holding in the corner with malice. I was about to trot out. Indignation wrapped around me like a cloak. When I remembered the terminal sitting on the teacher's desk. The screen was giving a soft glow. I trotted over and prepared to hack into it. Only well, to be the slightestly disappointed when it offered up its secrets readily. Such as they were. The entries were mainly filled with notes of attendance and grades, but two struck out though. First, had a real surprise when we tested the young unicorns on their magic today. I had all my ponies bring in their pets and show me how they could make them levitate. Simple enough, although a squirming animal can add a level of difficulty for foals at this age. I had let both Butter and Perdence each borrow the class mascot, since neither had a pet of their own. Prudence was thrilled, but I think Butter is terrified of the snake, even though she's not been told it's defanged and harmless. Needless to say, Butter didn't do well. The real surprise was little Quanta, who has been struggling with even minor levitation for all year. Now, I know these things have never been recorded in girls, but I can't imagine any other explanation. We had a full magical epiphany right here in our classroom. Quanta not only levitated herself, but she let out a flash of energy that affected all the pets in the room. Most just panicked and had to be recovered, but some, including a mascot, seemed to have vanished completely. And strangest of all, the arcane flash seemed to have transformed Carrot's tail ugly Carrot Tail's ugly old cat into well, an even uglier cat. It only lasted a moment, and Quanta seemed fine. Didn't even realize what she'd done. Of course, parents were called, and Carrot Tail was traumatized. It'll be a miracle if we can teach these fools anything for the rest of the week. Meanwhile, I'm going to try to put proposal to have another unicorn stallion watch over these tests from now on, just as a precaution. The second entry that struck out was four days later, and it was the last entry on the terminal. I expected a few parents to keep their colts and fillies home after the excitement that began at the beginning of this week, but by now they should be letting them back. Instead, attendance is at its lowest yet. Over half my students have skipped their classes today. If things haven't turned around after the weekend, I'm going to have to start calling parents. And if that doesn't work, maybe even the overstallion. I stared at the last entry for a while. Wait, the overstallion? Clementy looked at me cautiously. What's wrong? The overmare of this stable was an overstallion. He blinked, and then his eyes narrowed a little. What's wrong with that? The overmare is supposed to be an overmare. That's what's wrong. It's like I was explaining it to a child. But instead of understanding, his eyes narrowed even more. Are you saying a feller can't do what a gal can do? Taking it back suddenly, I tried to find the best way to explain. N no, it's not that at all. I waved my hoofs in negotiation. It's just that it's supposed to be the other way around. It's tradition. He didn't move. His voice 
was very even. You're saying, even if there was a feller who was better at leading a stable than any other pony, stallion or mare, and had a cutie mark to show it for everything, then he wouldn't be loud on account that he was a buck? I gulped, taking a step back. Damn it. But I was right. Yet there was nothing I could say to explain that I was right without digging myself deeper. So instead, I clammed up and said nothing. Clamity turned and walked out of the classroom. This time, I followed him. Okay, now I do feel a bit embarrassed. In front of us was another door to maintenance. To our right, the cafeteria, and to our left, a maintenance storeroom. In another storeroom, a glowing terminal, several shelves of supplies, and a poster on the wall of a mighty stallion standing brave and tall, facing danger head on and ready and able, while three mares crouched behind his hind hooves, frightened, but looking up at him for salvation. Adoration evident in their eyes. Calamity felt embarrassed, and I felt something creep more towards anger. It wasn't that this turn should have taken us towards the atrium. It could forgive, I could forgive a severe uh, diversions in stable design, although it didn't irk me. It wasn't the heroic stallion or the simpering mares. There's a desire to be special and to be admired for your accomplishments that the poster played, to which I fully understood. It wasn't even that this little, it was the fifth poster we'd come across, and all of them cantered to the same gender bias. It was that the stallion in the picture was valiantly holding a wrench in his teeth, and the unspeakable horror that the girl ponies all cringe and frightened from, like frightened bunnies, was just a leaky sink. Careful, so as not to step on another social line. Do you see why I'm upset? This isn't like, give it to the best pony. Who cares about tradition? This is... Yep, it's manipulation. All these posters have been here since the ponies trotted up to the stable to avoid the apocalypse. He turned and fixed me with a look. It's like saying there's a job fit for only either a mare or a stallion. I got the point. And that's only true for cooking. I stopped. My ears shot up for a moment. And I bet they could have been streaming. What? What's that supposed to? And then I caught his sly look. Oh, <laughs> I guess I deserved that. Yep. We were quiet a moment, then I turned to hack the storeroom terminal and read over the logs of a pony who appeared to be a maintenance supervisor, while Calamity hoof picked some supplies worth scavenging. The clanging and banging of the pipes continued ruthlessly, but for a moment I felt a little less stressed. I felt that I had just made it out of the social minefield, singed but intact. So naturally, that was the moment everything went to hell. I just finished the fourth entry, and was partway through the final entry, when my EFS flared up with that not one ghost, but five 